always remember that it's just as hard to write a bad book as it is to write a good book. <laughs> I was able to pass this lesson on to that Texas workshop, and it worked. It was oil on bloody waters. We were all grateful. One of the teachers that we had at Stanford was a guy named Dick Scowcroft. He wasn't very famous, and he was very unassuming, in fact, self-depreciating. But he, kind of like Jimmy Carter, would always take the position below you, and was a great teacher because of it. And one time, we had a very gifted writer in the class, an older guy named Mitch. And he read a story in that class that was devastatingly effective. It was a story about this guy and his brother got up and went and got a pig that had died of cholera and hooked it up behind a jeep and drug it 10 miles through the road, leaving this bloody slime behind it, and got to the hole in the uh, apron above the garbage disposal unit, tried to jam it down and only got halfway down. It wouldn't go down, so they had to chop it in half with an ax. As Skullcroft was reading this, he had a terrible stutter, and he shook a lot. And pretty soon, he was just shaking so bad. The paper just was just going like that. And he reached in his pocket, and he got this little thing of pills. It was rattling around in the place like he finally got a little pill out. And he put it in his mouth, and you could hear that little pill shooting from side of the mouth, like that. And all of the class sat there and waited until that pill took effect. And, and he calmed down, and his shivering stopped, and he finished the story. And I think what we learn from that is that when you're in involved in this kind of situation, everybody has a lot on the line, and you don't want to hurt anybody. And we didn't want to hurt this guy, because we liked him. Mitch went ahead and knocked up Stegner's daughter, and ended up in... Uh, Vacaville for stealing books from the rare book room. <laughs> but he was a good writer. <laughs> Every writer I know teaches. At some point, you have to, even if you don't have to. It's like having to yell instructions during a high school wrestling match if you used to be a collegiate gra grappler. You may not have been any world beater, but you had your own little specialty. Two or three good moves that you could pull out of your pocket. A few simple tricks, like look away from the half Nelson, or swing out on that bar arm, fool. For some reason, you have to yell these things. Have to teach what you were taught, especially if you were taught by a great coach. It's been my good fortune to have a number of such coaches. Bill Hammer taught me the bar arm series, the basis of most pinning hold combinations. In speech 101, Robert C. Clark, who was eventually became the president of the university over at the University of Oregon and was my speech teacher and then my uh, advisor and then my dean and then my president. Good old guy. Speech 101, Robert C. Clark taught me the three secrets of good diction. Lips, tongue, and teeth. Lips, tongue, and teeth. <laughs> and a great writer teacher named James B. Hall revealed for me one of the keyholes of literature. I was a junior at the University of Oregon, majoring in speech and drama. One of the requirements toward a degree was a term of TV writing. My screenplay instructor told me, you need to learn something about story. I'm transferring you to J.B. Hall's fiction class. Fine with me. I love fiction, especially the science sort. Ray Bradbury was my favorite. They don't get any better than Bradbury. I was fond of explaining. <laughs> then Professor Hall had me read a story by Ernest Hemingway called Soldier's Home and asked me to explain to the class what the story was about. Well, I shrugged. All I can see is about this guy Krebs sitting in his mother's kitchen eating breakfast. She's hollering on him about getting out into the house and getting a job and developing some interest now that the war is over, but all he wants to do is go watch his sister play baseball someplace. No, Professor Hall said. Here's what it's about. Here. He strode over in his white shoes and stabbed a finger on a paragraph in the middle of my textbook. 
right after his mother has served him with bacon and eggs and is telling him how she carried him next to her heart. What does Krebs do? What does he look at? Read it again aloud. The paragraph was only one line long. Krebs looked at his plate and saw the bacon fat going cold and hard. That's what the story is about. That one line is the key. That line sounds the note for all the rest of the story. The whole composition would be in disharmony without that key to tune to, see? And I'm damned if I didn't. <laughs> and that key unlocked for me the great resounding hall of real literature and eventually got me in the door. A couple of short stories won me a Woodrow Wilson to the famous Wallace Stegner writing class at Stanford. Professor Stegner mistook me, I fear, for an anti-intellectual, not understanding that I was in fact far something far less presupposing, a near illiterate, <laughs> especially co compared to the rest of his blue chip roster. There was C.K. Koch from Australia, my year of living dangerously, Ernest Gaines, the life of Miss Jean Pittman, Tilly Olson, tell me a riddle, Peter Beagle, A Fine and Private Place, The Last Unicorn, Robert Stone, A Hall of Mirrors, Dog Soldiers, Flag for Sunrise, Children of Light, Ken Babs, Cassidy in the Back House, a trio called the Kentucky Mafia, Wendell Berry, Ed McClanahan, and Gurney Norman, all with numerous and notable novels and collection in print, and Larry McMurtry, with a pile of work that should reach if all the pages, pages are ever laid end to end, from Texas to Stockholm. There were others, but you get the idea. A hell of a team, like Green Bay under Lombardi. And when you include the assistant coaches, Richard Scowcroft, Malcolm Cowley, Frank O'Connor, you've got a hell of a program. Maybe we weren't entirely aware of this at the time. This was in the wild, young years of the early 60s, remember, there was an awful lot to be aware of. But we have all surely looked back on those seasons together with something like awe. There is a binding tie about being part of a good, tight team, a bond that never fully unravels when the, team, when the season ends and the members go their different directions. Most of us still keep in touch, and many of us are lifetime friends, family. My kids. Ed's kids, Wendell's kids, and Bob Stone's kids have all known each other all their lives. Ken Babs' kids have all gone to the same school as mine, kindergarten to graduation. Moreover, Cowley's lesson has kept us all available to each other as kind and considerate critics. We can send each other unfinished drafts without fear of getting cleverly gutted by some green-eyed literary demon with a grudge to grind. When a flag for sunrise wins Bob Stone the National Book Award, or Larry gets the Pulitzer for Lonesome Dove, I feel nothing but joy for their glory. It does us all proud. Another of Cowley's teachings, good writing, glories all writers. We aren't in competition. So okay, all in well and good to say, but after doing enough of those posh little weekend workshops, I learned it isn't so easy to bring off. Competition is often in full swing before the visiting coach gets there. If young Mr. Millenhead comes down hard on Ms. Melancholia's tender tale of troubled teenage girls in the Bougainvillea, <laughs> you can bet your best thesaurus that Ms. Melancholia is going to thump Millenhead roundly for his roisterous romp in the ROTC camp. <laughs> After years of refereeing this cruel and futile give and take, I hit upon a plan. Have everybody work on the same project. Even better than walking a mile in the other writer's moccasins, mix them up till nobody can be sure whose or whose. <laughs> After talking this plan over with a number of people at the University of Oregon for a number of years, I got a job. The writing department picked me out a baker's dozen from the creative writing program second year grad students ranging from the ages of 22 to 42. My wife and I own this two-story house near the campus, or making payments on it anyway, but we'd never lived there. It's about two blocks from the U of O library. 
The living room in it is big enough to hold 13 people around a long table. This table is important. The table in the Jones room at Stanford was as important as the books on the shelves. It was a long and oval shaped with an indentation at one end where the teacher sat like a captain at the helm. My first day of class, I headed in from the farm nervous and late. My palms were moist and my mouth was dry. I was driving my 1973 Eldorado convertible, white with red trim, hoping to make an impressive entrance. <laughs> I swing into the drive, and there they all are, waiting. But the house is locked, and Faye gone. With, I don't have a key to get in. <laughs> I'm a farm boy. I get through a little window into the basement, but the door is locked at the top of the basement steps. I crawl back out. I find one rear window that I can see isn't locked, but it is painted so tight I can't get it open. I get the tire iron out of the car. I pry it into the sill and I push the window open. I get a good grip. I make a jump. I hit my head on the bottom of the window frame I've just pried up. Knocks myself clean out. <laughs> I fall in with my legs sticking up and as I'm coming to, I hear somebody outside say, well, that's Curly. Wonder when Larry and Mo get here. <laughs> I knew at that point we were all going to get along okay. <laughs> My first assignment was that they write a character sketch about themselves in the third person. It doesn't take very long, an assignment like that. As I collected the papers, I told them the goals and the rules of the class. The goals were to conceive, rough out, write, rewrite, and submit a finished novel in the three terms allotted us. The rules were even simpler and fewer only two. The first rule being that we cannot tell anybody outside the class the plot of the novel we're working on. Not all you young wizards, this is a good rule to remember, even your wife. The more that you can keep this thing in its own little eggshell and let it incubate, you don't want to rush out of the kitchen with this half-baked cake stuff hanging all over you. Wait till it's nice and frosted and bring it out. Second rule, was that I make up half the class. In a critical dispute, I wanted to be able to call G or Haw and keep plowing. A crop like we were going to try to bring in didn't have time to luxuriate in literary debate. The season was too short. After reading the character sketches that came back, I said, OK, it's clear to me you guys can write. We can all write. Now what? will we write. It took several sessions of this before they all gradually came to the grudging realization that I really didn't have a cold idea in hell what we were going to write. No plot, no characters, nothing. I did come up with some suggestions about what to avoid. And this, if I'm trying to tell people how to become successful, I think it's easier to say what to avoid than what to go after. Uh, I've seen a lot of writers get stuck in various mental tar babies that if they had just gone around that little tar baby, they have the ability. In fact, right away, as soon as you're dealing with this, all these students and read their stuff, you realize almost all of these people that come to, to writing classes can already write. They can write. We can all write. We realized at one point that if a terrorist came in the door with the news, he said, write, all of you, write, 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 right now, write, <laughs> that you could do it. And you'd keep doing it as long as you kept the Uzi on you. <laughs> it, it's not an inability to write. It's our uh, indecision about what to write. And then once you get into it, knowing what the rules are about the way you've chosen. Because each work, whether it's a work of art or music or literature, has to make up its own set of rules, and then the whole work has to abide by those rules. I've just finished reading Geek Love, which I like a lot. Good book. But at a certain point in Geek Love, you feel she begins to break her own rules. About three quarters of the way through it, she's got you going, she's picked you up, she's carrying you good, and you feel like she's going to put you down.